Good morning. Welcome to um, Bergen Baptist, our Sunday school this morning. Miss Rita is going to uh, lead us. Let's pray together and we'll let uh, the Lord speak through her. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for technology. We thank you for those that are watching online, those in the parking lot, and those that are in the building. We ask for your blessings upon our teacher, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We are continuing our study of Isaiah, which is not a very easy book. Uh, but anyway, it's very informative. So I have enjoyed teaching from it. Today, our scripture is Isaiah 46, 3 through 13. So while you're turning or opening your Bibles to that passage, Isaiah 46, 3 through 13, I'm going to give you some background on some things that have been happening in, in a few of the chapters that we probably are not going to be looking at. All through our study of Isaiah, we have seen evidences of God's plan for his people. God has a plan, and he's committed to it. He wants to save his people, and nothing is going to keep him from accomplishing this plan of salvation, not even the hard-heartedness of the people he will save. And we've seen that all through history. It's not just in Isaiah, but if you look at your old and your New Testaments, people are so hard-hearted. Every one of us, at one time or another, has had a plan or have had a task that we wanted to complete. And in order to complete this task, we have stayed dedicated to that plan until it was finished. And God, no less, has done the same. Some uh, little bit about our background for today's lesson. The Babylonian Empire was, was ultimately destroyed Judah and its capital city of Jerusalem. Many of the survivors would be carried into captivity and forced to settle outside the city of Babylon, where they would dwell for approximately 70 years. To the captive, captives of those facing captivity, it is likely seemed impossible to believe that God was in control and would bring them back home. Yet, this, was, this is exactly what God had planned to do. In chapters 42 through 48, we see a continuation of the hopeful message of Israel's coming redemption from Babylonian exile. In chapter 42, Israel was told to sing a new song because there would be redemption for the whole world. God's redemption was not limited to Israel. Rather, all the places of the world were would be um, taken care of. In Isaiah 43 through 45, we have more information about the restoration from, or the future restoration from Babylon. God would redeem his people from captivity by his power and pour out his spirit on his people so they would flourish. God would bring forth a king. It would be Cyrus, the Persian king, who would, who in God's ultimate power would accomplish his purpose for saving the people from captivity. Chapter 46 encouraged God's people to trust that he would accomplish his plans. God reassured them that Babylon would fall and be put to shame because God is the one and only who, person who is in charge. Chapter 46 that we will be looking at today starts out with a reference to a religious festival that's going on in Babylon. We don't actually read about it in our scripture references today. It takes place in verses 1 and 2. Part of the ceremony, uh, the idols represented the Babylonian gods Nebo and Baal, and they were decorated and they were carried around the city on a cart. Isaiah shows these idols as being very small and insignificant. He mocked them in a way that left no doubt that they were powerless. Okay, let's start off today's lesson with verse 3. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel, 
you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born. In verse 3, God called to his captive people, listen to me, you descendants of Jacob. God called his people to pay attention to what he had done in the past and what he was about to do in the future. In Deuteronomy, Israel was on the verge of entering the promised land. In Isaiah, Israel was about to be restored to the promised land. In both cases, the emphasis was on trusting God based on his past actions. The fact that the people were addressed as the house of Jacob in Isaiah may also indicate a restored unity to the people of God. It is a term that reflects a time before the kingdom was divided into Israel and Judah. And it seems to be that the people who remained in captivity, the remnant, were one people of God again instead of citizens of separate kingdoms. God confirmed this idea of Israel as one unified people by affirming his involvement with them from the origin as a people. God has upheld them since their birth and carried them since they were born. These statements show God as father and Israel as his child. In contrast to the idols that were created and carried by their worshipers, God is the creator and the one who carries his people. The image of birthing and carrying shows both God's parental care and his power. He brought the people into the world and he was with them as they grew. At no time were they outside of his control even though it might felt as if they were. Okay, let's move on to verse four. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. God described himself in a series of I statements. These descriptions are linked to the idea of a father caring for his child. God stated, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he who will sustain you. These statements reinforce the images of sustaining and caring from verse three. God is consistent. As he saved his people from Egypt, he would now save them from Babylon. There is in an unexpected twist though. This divine care would occur in the people's old age. As parents age, it becomes the child's duty to care for them, even as the parents cared for the child in his early life. Yet God did not switch roles with his people as time passed by. He was the one who would provide for his people in their twilight years. At no point did God did the people carry God or did they need to help him? God is powerful and unchanging. In contrast, the idols could do nothing. They must be carried and cared for. The focus of the people needed to be on their God instead of on their situations. Can idols take care of people the way God can? I think not. Let's, um, God used two other statements that clarify this idea that the people will be dependent on him. First, he said, I have made you. In other words, the existence of Jacob or Israel was a result of God's creative activity. He also went on to state, I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Okay. Let's go on with to verses five through seven. With whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? Some pour out gold from their bags and weigh out silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith to make it into gold to a God and they bow down and worship it. They lift it to their shoulders and carry it and they set it up in its place and there it stands. From that spot, it cannot move. Even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer. 
It cannot save them from their troubles. God asked his people, with whom will you compare me or count me as equal? The whole reason the Israelites would go into captivity was because they were worshiping other gods. They did not view God as enough, and so they started in engaging in idol making. It was like a person who has several relationships going on at one time, just in case one of them doesn't work out. God made it clear that the idols were lifeless objects. Could the people really say a lifeless object was comparable to a real living being? <clears throat> okay, in verses 6 through 7, the, it explains exactly just how lifeless and powerless these idols were. The precious metals of gold and silver were used, but they had to be fashioned by a goldsmith. Inanimate material was fashioned into a shape by a skilled worker. The people would then bow down and worship these objects. Isaiah was mocking the idea that people would make something and then worship it. Clearly, the prophet wanted his audience to realize the folly of expecting something they made to deliver them from their troubles. With a reference to the previous verses, Isaiah noted that the people had to lift the idols and carry them to the place where they wanted to put them. This raised the question of whether they were wise enough to worship something they had to carry. How much power can an idol have if it can't get where it needs to be by itself? You know, I, I, it just blows my mind that people would do this. And as I was reading this, I can't, I was thinking, how could people be so stupid? But we all have idols. If you think about it seriously, they may not be the idols that are made from gold and silver that people bowed down to in these Old Testament times. But if you think about it seriously enough, many, many times we put idols before Jesus. Things like missing church to go somewhere else. That is an idol, or valuing money over Jesus. So it's not just these material things. So when I thought about that, I thought, yeah, we do. Okay, let's go on to verses 8 through 9. Remember this. Keep it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I don't see how much clearer you could really get than that. I almost, when I was reading this, thought, you know, I could picture God stomping, maybe, as he said this, you know, or pounding his fist down on a table. You know, I am God, and there's nobody but me. God called the people to remember this. Keep it in mind. The command to remember does not mean just to call something to, to your mind. It is a call to action. It is a command. Remembering the nature of idols leads to the rejection of their worship. Remembering what happened long ago was a call to trust God on the basis of his past acts of salvation. Unfortunately, many of the people were failing to take the words of God to heart and were not contemplating just how trustworthy God is. Instead, they were continuing to be rebels, not believing that God would do what he declared he would do. They did not think God would really deliver them, and they continued to turn to these lifeless idols. But God once more reminded them of his faithfulness from the beginning, continuing with the command to remember God encouraged the doubters to remember their very earliest history, the former things, and perhaps even the creation of the world itself. The existence of Israel and every nation in the world could be attributed to one indisputable fact. God stated, I am God, 
and there is no other. No other gods had a part in the past, present, or future events playing out in the lives of the Israelites. No human or idol could be credited with the events of history. Only God was present at the beginning through the people's current situation. Only God would be with them in the future. Okay, let's look at verses 10 through 11. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey, from the far off land a man to fulfill my, my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. God is all powerful and has always been. He reminded the people that he had predicted the events that they were experiencing. And he stated, I make known the end from the beginning. God made it clear that rather than being a sign of his defeat, the exile was actually evidence of his control of the events. God had repeatedly warned the people that if they failed to turn away from their sin, they would be exiled from the land of Israel. However, there was also hope. For God promised that when the people turned back to him, he would rescue them. In verse 11, God was even more specific about how he would rescue his people. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. This bird of prey was described as a man to fulfill my purpose. There can be little doubt that this was Cyrus, the ruler of Medo-Persia. But Cyrus was the ruler who conquered Babylon in, 15, in 539 to 538 BC. After this conquest, he decreed the captives could return to their native lands. So ultimately, God had planned the events Israel will experience. Knowing this should have given the people in exile every confidence in their future deliverance. So he used this king to free the Israelites. Okay, let's look at verses 12 through 13. Listen to me, you stubborn-hearted, you who are now far from my righteousness. I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away, and my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. In the final verses of chapter 46, God, through his prophet, returned to the initial command stated in verse 3. Listen to me, you stubborn-hearted. How clear is that? Once again, God reminded the people that he was consistent in his actions, past and present. The result of listening should have been a love for God, but many of the re re Israelites remained stubborn-hearted. They did not believe God would do what he said he would do. God had demonstrated he is faithful to his word, and he had even predicted the future. There was no reason to doubt his future redemptive action for the people in exile, yet some still did not believe. Many of the Israelites with their hard hearts refused to believe and therefore were far from righteousness. However, even the unbelief of the house of Jacob would not stop God's plans. You know, and I've wondered over the years, over and over and over again, God was with his people. I wonder if he got tired just a little bit of people turning away from him. You know, it would be so depressing, I think, to, to try this so many times and the people still know. His righteousness, he would bring his righteousness near. Deliverance would happen on God's timetable. God described this as my salvation, and it belonged to him. The people could do nothing to save themselves. Idols certainly could not save them. 
Only God could deliver them and return them to their land. The restoration of the people had always been the plan. The exile and punishment were always meant to produce the needed change in the hearts of the people so they could be restored to a right relationship with the Lord. The salvation of the Lord would be centered in Zion. It was the center of the promised land. The promised land, in turn, was the second Garden of Eden. So in the middle of this special place, God would walk and dwell with his people again. Like Adam and Eve, the Israelites had been kicked out of the special place of fellowship. Unlike Adam and Eve, though, they would be restored to both place and fellowship with the Lord. The splendor of God would be in Israel. God would get the glory for being faithful to his word and to restore his people. And the Israelites would benefit from God's glory by being restored to fellowship. 